You're listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And we're missing television's Daniel Freeb this week, but we are joined by Ned Bolting. Hello, Richard. Hi, Ned. Hello. It's, it's been a while. Yes, podcasting's it, Richard Moore. It has. Maybe maybe about a year. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. We, I can't remember that. I, we, I dropped in, in on, during you the Tour de France. You made a cameo during the Tour de France. I yeah. think that Montpellier, wasn't it? It was a crosswind When stage. the wind blew. Peter and um, Sagan, Chris yeah. Froome, Geraint Thomas. All that. Yeah, and Sagan and Sagan was going to gift the stage to his teammates who didn't, and then Chris Froome didn't realise that that Bodnar was it Bodnar, Magic yeah, Bodnar. It was. and Who's Chris Froome didn't really realise the kind of etiquette of that because he doesn't really get cycling. He hasn't really Froome. followed it for long. Has he, he doesn't follow the Tour de France. He's not steeped so, in this. <laughs> so uh, so we went and sort of like turned it into a race, and Sagan went, "Oh, well, if we're going to do that, then I'll have to win." Yeah. What's a, what a year he's had. Terrible. What a year you lot have had. I pick up the Evening Standard, and there you are, being quoted in the mainstream media. Mm, mm. Well, we should explain that we're talking How a couple Telegraph of weeks ago. How did feel about that? <laughs> we were talking a couple of weeks ago. Um, <laughs> we're, 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 speaking, we're speaking to Ned uh, on the eve of his nationwide tour, um, which is, to quote, probably a live spectacular theatrical event all about bicycles. Yeah, I don't know who put the word spectacular in. <laughs> At one point, uh, I, I use a prop. Mm-hmm. In fact, I've had some I've had some props built that I've yet to see because we're recording this on the eve of the tour starting. Mm. I have to say, so I'm a bit worried about knowing my lines. So well, I've got several props, but I can't give them away. They're, they're, they're central to the way that the plot of the evening unfolds. Wow. I will say though that a bicycle, co- two bicycle components, are brought onto the stage. One of which is hashtag iconic. Well, that's why wow. it has deserves the, the spectacular in the title and the description. Why. It's That's called why. Bicology, Ned. I'm yeah. I, Ned. Ned Bolting's Bicology is the title of the tour. Why not Tour de Ned? That's that strikes me as. Do you know the, that's the Tour de Ned? If you were to, if you were to come, as I believe you will do, to the show and um, purchase a program, you will find the words Tour de Ned being used. So and we'll get on to the the, the, the talking about the live a spectacular quid. theatrical quid, event. You are, you are, you are. We're, this is the week of your Grand Depart. Might be as much as a So you'll be. You'll, anyway, we'll get on to yeah. that in a moment. Well, yeah. just hang before on before that. Before can, that. We do, can we do the news roundup of first, course. please? We want to know what's this. actually been going on. Let's find out. Lionel, over to you. I'll get my crystal ball out and do the news roundup in the future, in the past. Wow! And if your mind isn't blown by that, it will be by this. Thank you from the past. This is the present, and some of the latest news in professional cycling. At the London Sixth Day, Belgians Kenny de Ketteler and Moreno de Pau successfully defended their title, dramatically gaining a lap late in the final Madison and clinching an 11-point victory over Bradley Wiggins and Mark Cavendish. Next on the circuit is the Ghent Sixth Day, where Wiggins and Cavendish will team up again. Now, that was supposed to be Wiggins' final race as a professional, but during the podium ceremony in London, he hinted that he might continue his career into 2017. To cyclocross and the European Championships, Toon Ertz of Belgium was a surprise winner of the men's title in Pont Chateau in France. He beat the two pre-race favourites, Mathieu van der Poel and Wout van Aert, into second and third place. Thalita de Jong of the Netherlands won the women's race, adding the European Championships to her world title, but it was a race to forget for two British riders. Right at the start, Helen Wyman hit Nicky Bramia's rear wheel going into the first corner and both riders went down. Wyman broke her collarbone and Bramia needed several stitches to her face. After an investigation into sexism, British Cycling has upheld track sprinter Jess Varnish's claims that Shane Sutton used inappropriate and discriminatory language towards her. Sutton continues to deny that he told Varnish to go and have a baby after she was dropped from British Cycling's Olympic programme. He had resigned as technical director of British Cycling and until last week had been hopeful that there'd be a way back for him. In an interview with Sky Sports, he said that there had been a conversation with Varnish about her weight and admitted he had said she needed to lose some timber. Sutton is now looking for alternative employment in cycling and says he has a few irons in the fire. Varnish welcomed the verdict, saying in a statement, I spoke out because I wanted to shine a light on the culture at British Cycling, a culture that in my mind was incorrect. 
Post. Meanwhile, MPs are set to pose questions about Bradley Wiggins, Team Sky and the medical package couriered by the then BC employee Simon Cope to Sky's Dr Richard Freeman at the end of the 2011 Dauphiné. A Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee is expected to meet at the end of November and several key figures could be called to answer questions. There's a few high-profile transfers to confirm. Sky have signed the Italian Diego Rosa from Astana and Frenchman Kenny Ellisond from FDJ, bolstering their climbing options. And Heinrich Hausler, who was runner-up in the 2009 Milan San Remo and Paris-Roubaix and was riding for IM Cycling before they folded, has joined Bahrain Marida. Finally, the 1986 world champion Moreno Argentine has been jailed for a year for mortgage fraud, according to La Gazzetta de la Sport. And 2002 Vuelta winner Aitor Gonzalez has been arrested, suspected of being involved in a robbery at a mobile phone store in Alicante in Spain. Finally, just a mention for our sponsors Eurosport, who will be showing the UCI Track Cycling World Cup from Glasgow this weekend. That's the opening round of this winter's World Cup series. Starts on Friday, November the 4th at 7pm with live coverage continuing on Saturday at 7pm and on Sunday at 2. Now back to the past again. Thanks for that, Lionel. No problem, Richard. Back here in the present, which is also <laughs> the past. Um, it's nice to Bob got a win though, isn't it? it <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> talking about Ned Bolting's biology tour... Um, it's very much a tour of Britain. Some horrendous transfers here between the stages. <laughs> now, Bury St Edmunds, then Chelmsford, then Yeovil, then Portsmouth, then Leeds. Has Mick Bennett <laughs> say this? <laughs> Who's put there, this together? There will be some complaints. You're right. Sore limbs and that. I'm actually going to. I'm going to ride from Bury St Edmunds to Chelmsford um, on Thursday. Thursday morning. I Quite think that's the only one I can do by bike. Quite a few rest days as well. So a few rest days, yeah. It's a schedule, but a lot of dates there. How many is it in total? 15, 16? 12, 14, something like that. I genuinely don't know. But that's nothing in Scotland. Them. No, and there's been Tour of Britain-esque complaints about that. And all Wales. Complaints? All Are you sure about that? Complaints. <laughs> complaints. It was not in response to requests. <laughs> <laughs> that there is no date it's, in Scotland. It's actually amazing that you put out a tour and instantly you get people who feel snubs that you're yeah. not, you know, whatever. But um, it finishes in London at the Clapham Grand and I'll, I'll be there. It finishes at Clapham Grand, which someone described to me, I didn't have been to the Clapham Grand, but someone, <laughs> I was at a posh cycling event a couple of weeks ago and someone came out and said, I'm coming to your thing at, um, I'm coming to your thing in a few weeks at the Clapham Grand. I have to say it's a bit chavvy. <laughs> and I went, all right. So you're there then? I think it's a night nightclub, is it not? Yeah, Ordinarily. mostly a nightclub. But for one night only, it'll be turned into a, a cauldron of cycling thing. Cauldron of cycling thing. Well, we'll get. Well, well we are going to talk about that. I mean, we're going to we're going to quiz you on other things while you're here, Ned. Yeah. I mean, th- you're a, you're a fully fledged commentator now. Yeah. Um, we'll get onto that in part two, and and you've certainly covered a lot of races this year that you've never been to before, yeah. and you were obviously at the Giro, you were at the Tour, and the and the Vuelta, and you've done a lot of kind of very obscure as well so let's speak to you about that in part two but tell us about this this tour you've got a book out as well the velosaurus there's no connection there's, between n- there's the no two. connection except a pure coincidence of time um the tour is uh, kind of divided into two halves literally and um thematically right so it's an evening with an interval theaters like intervals so they can flog wine and stuff and i quite like the idea nice of stretch coming into the well. second half a little bit tipsy as well it might make my job a bit easier um but the first half is an opportunity for me to um, bite the hand that feeds me a little and as you know and i think you know lionel i have um a, s- a c- kind of certain take on the cycling community i'm a technical numpty i'm not interested in te- technical stuff and how bikes work um i have certain kind of um reservations about the way we're headed as a cycling culture in the united kingdom that i believe you probably share to a certain extent and um I like poking fun at people and it's an opportunity to poke fun at myself but also just generally kind of um, amongst friends uh, analyse our peculiarities, our eccentricities and the the things that that make us, unite us, make us both wonderful but also a little bit risible as well. And the second half I turn my attention much more to 15 years or whatever it is of the Tour de France and um, what's been interesting is I've trawled back through the video archive back to 2003 and stuff like that. Got an amazing interview with a very young David Miller, pre-doping ban, uh, recorded in 2003, where I, I, I actually remember doing an interview where I kind of like sidle up to him and he's just had one of his epically horrible days on a bike. And, um, and he's giving it the full, he's got the beanie hat on, the full attitude, and he's kind of slouching around like Kevin the teenager. And um, that has to be seen to be believed. And I, so I, I run that clip to the audience in the theatre on a screen and then I show a little video I shot this summer of David Miller watching that video and his sort of like 
I was going to say teenage self, but that's how he comes across. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the contrast between this kind of um, posh, Maserati-driven um, elder statesman that he's become now and that precocious twerk that he but was. But the 2003 tour was your first, and that was also the famous yep. one of the Yellow Jumper, because it, yep. it was in an interview with Miller where you let that slip that he was disappointed not to talking about David jumper. Miller de-chaining on the, on the, yeah. in the prologue that mm. I referred to the, mm. the Yellow Jumper. But, um, but what, what about, I mean, about apart from race? the way that Miller has changed, what about you, Ned? I mm. mean, when you look back at some of that old footage of you arriving well, at the tour as a green... About 10 kilos lighter. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> now? You are yeah, 10 yeah, kilos lighter. Yeah, yeah, I am now, yeah. Because I, I slipped into my mid-30s, and, you know, unbeknownst to me, I'd kind of th- start to thicken out in the way that people do. And I certainly didn't ride a bike. <laughs> and um, I came back from that tour and thought, this is how, this is how infantile my thinking is. God. Cycling's quite good, isn't it? Maybe I'd better get a bike. So I went down to Halfords and bought a mountain bike for 80 quid, and that's how it kind of, that's what put me on a bike. But do you know what? As weird as that sounds, I think that, I genuinely think that a lot of people at, at the same time were making the same connection between watching Lance Armstrong fall on Lazard du Den and going to Halfords. It's nuts, isn't it? But, uh, that, you know, there aren't many other sports that have d- done that. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, you're, you're right. I mean, that, that was such an exciting tour, such a, a good first tour to cover and I, I suspect that it was around that time it was Lance Armstrong's fifth tour win yep. it was it was around the time the Armstrong show was starting to really get some transcend traction. Yep. beyond well beyond cycling and, and pick up followers from you know other sports so on and, and it's probably the start of that huge community of cycling beginning to really grow here in the UK it's hard to th- it's hard to um it's hard to remember quite what that was like Lionel were you out on the road on that tour I mean the the, the the scale of the interest in Armstrong, um, his charisma, the attention he attracted, um, and everything that surrounded him blew me away. Actually, I wasn't prepared for quite the superstar that he was back then and the fuss that surrounded him. And when I think back, um, I can, you know, with everything that we know now and kind of almost knew a little bit at the time, the one, the one thing you have to say is you can't, I can't un- unenjoy that tour. I can't sort of unpick the fact that it was absolutely beguiling. As an introduction to the sport, it was totally fascinating from start to finish well I, I, yeah I, that was in my brief hiatus away from covering cycling so I kind of missed the middle Armstrong years I for once witnessed the first three and then the last one in 2005 you did all the boring I mean, I think, I think <laughs> it was it was kind of it was following those tours that sort of drove you away was it, it was not? really yeah I was fed up by um, just the fact that the, the cult of Lance Armstrong kept getting bigger and bigger and there was such a whiff around it all, um, yeah. even in 2001, that I'd had enough really and thought that was that was me and, and covering cycling done. Um, when I came back in 2005 and I did a few days on that tour, what struck me was just how enormous he was by that stage. I mean, it was... A bit like Ned. Com- complete, <laughs> completely, uh, you know, the, in the gap between 2001 where he was, you know, he was just starting to lengthen his stride in, in a way, wasn't he? Yeah, he was sort of yeah. marching around the tour, yeah. you know, as if he owned the place. By 2005, he certainly did. And, um, you know, his sort of defiant farewell on the podium um, when he said, you know... He was sad for anyone who couldn't believe in this wonderful spectacle and uh, believe in the, the great champions alongside him who were Jan Ulrich and Ivan Basso. Um, of course, they were all heroes with feet of clay, weren't they? Um, you know, it was... But Armstrong had become enormous by that stage and the, the Tour de France really was the Tour de Lance by 2005. And, um, yeah, it was... It was Almost like pressing the reset button in 2006, wasn't it? Suddenly it <laughs> felt much smaller. Pressing some sort of button anyway, wasn't it? It, it, it was it, the ejector it, button, possibly. It, 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 but it felt it felt small and less significant, yeah. Yeah. and it felt like Diminished. it might. With the, with the Operation Puerto scandal in 2006, there was this sense that you know, had Armstrong been there, none of this would have blown up. The lid would have been kept very solidly on it. But because there was no imposing, strong character on the tour, it just shattered apart, didn't it? Do you know, the other thing, going back through the archives and you know, preparing for the biology tour, the, the, the video that struck me was, um, there was a, and I can't remember which, off the top of my head, I can't remember whether it's 2004 or five, but there was a stage early on in that tour in the Vosges Mountains where Armstrong got isolated, I think on the Ballon d'Alsace. Yeah? So yeah. you're nodding like you remember that. And we were sc- I remember screaming at the television, saying, attack him, one of you, like Basso and you know, Ulrich, do something. It, when, are you, when are you ever going to get that? No one did, of course. And then I interviewed Armstrong at the end of that stage and um, pushed him quite hard on, um, and I found this tape, pushed him quite hard on what, what was, where were your team, what went wrong and all this sort of thing. And he, um, he smiled. I said, how are you going to put it right? And he smiles at me and he says, that's a very good question. 
And then he kind of looks down and he smiles, quite clearly smiles, and he goes, I've got a pretty good idea of how to put things right. And of course, we now know with hindsight, you know, <laughs> having read the autobiography, exactly what he did. But the fact that he could, thought he could just smirk in front of a, a live camera as he envisaged the massive <laughs> industrial doping his team was about to undertake is absolutely Remember that clearly. It was uh, Peter Weening, I think, won the stage mm-hmm. ahead of Andreas Cloden. Got away. By millimetres. What's that? By very, very close. Very margin, close. Wasn't but it? yeah, it was Cloden that got away, who was perhaps, because he was also. It was that t- triumvirate of T-Mobile. Yeah, Vinukarov was there. and Yeah, it was a missed opportunity, it you was. felt. But then, you know, with a massive blood transfusion. The, the very next summit finished. I don't know if it was the next mm. day or the next but one. They were the rest day. Oh, nine I think of them, wasn't yeah. it? It was yeah. like, all, they yeah. were all there. Mm. It was yeah, amazing. remarkable. So you show some of this footage I do, in, yeah. in the show. And it, it, I guess, yeah, to look back on that... Um, it's like, all, it's like videotape is a very strange thing, isn't it? Because on the one hand, it looks quite bland. It's not filmic. It kind of looks quite ordinary. But with the passage of time, very quickly, it acquires a kind of vintage. And nostalgia kicks in surprisingly early. So even when you look back, even though 2003 still seems to me like relatively recently, recent, it isn't, you know. And the, the, the kit is different. The colours are somehow different. The, everything is just sufficiently different enough for you to go, oh, it kind of takes your breath away, actually. Yeah, it's and nostal- straight away you're in that you're world. Nostalgic again, you know. almost already, um, yeah. and and yeah, it does it does happen remarkably quickly. I'm looking at old footage of the 2012 tour the other day, and you know already the Adidas um, Sky yeah, Adidas just, kit just looks dated. It does it? look dated. I mean, it's the fact that you're, you've been able to, and we've done live events before. Um, you know, three of us or two of us sitting chatting in, in front of an audience. I guess a, a, it's basically a stand-up show that you've created. Um, is a, a logical sort of progression from that evolution of that. We, we talked about it, didn't we? I mean, there's a lot of demand for, the, I think, you know, people to be in a, in a kind of theatre, the you know, event. the live the live event. And it was, I suppose, it was formalising the kind of events that us three have taken part in. I've done on my own quite uh, quite often, um, and turning that into a thing it wasn't actually my idea. Some producers came and approached me about it um, and uh, said. You know, sooner or later, someone's going to do one about cycling. It might as well be you. You'd be that, irritated if it was What does that say about the way that the cycling culture in the UK has, has grown and developed? Not just grown, but, but developed. That you can create a show that is a... a, a it's a comedy. Mm. It's a comedy show, isn't it? Mm. That, mm. that, you know, it's yeah. not just... I about hesitate to call it stand-up, but yeah, I want people to laugh and well, enjoy themselves. But when you start doing the events, they are informative. They're giving people insight into what it's like to be at the races, the riders, etc., so for that to develop into something that you can make, make comedy out of, does that, what does that say about the way the culture has developed? I think it says something about... I, I think what it does do is it says something about the nature of this particular sport that we, we still, I hope, love, otherwise you wouldn't be doing the podcast and the job you're doing, that it is such a hard sport to approach as an outsider and such a hard um, lock to unpick and such a hard c- code to crack. But w- when you do get that to that point of release, it's hugely rewarding and you just want, and it kind of drives this thirst to want more and more and more you know and i think that's i think you know i think that's what it is and it, that's maybe a peculiarly british story and a very recent story but there's you know w- what it does say is there's a lot of demand and not enough supply still you know people want to sit down and talk you know there'll be lots and lots and lots of your many many podcast listeners could think of nothing better than spending a what is it tuesday afternoon sitting in where we are just chewing the cud and talking I mean, in the way that we're talking we'll maybe come to this more in the third part but uh, do you get the sense that is that is it still is the, the demand still going up and up or do you see a, le- a leveling that. off others are less than <laughs> do you see a leveling you off what's quite interesting is um and i remember well i used to work exclusively for itv for my broadcast work and i remember a previous head of itv telling me that um people should never forget at itv that um it's a very there's a very northern bias to ITV's viewing figures. Um, it's quite a northern channel. That's where a lot of its f- core fan base is. And I think cycling's a bit like that, actually. So I know from feedback from the ticket sales and the venues that are uh, always hard to sell tickets in London, relatively. Um, and we've done events in London, haven't we? They've been less than well attended. Um, but the further, you know, if you go, the real, so what I've discovered is the heartlands are Lancashire and Yorkshire. And um, to a certain extent, you know, other counties uh, around there, but the Northwest and, and, and Yorkshire are just insane with the way it's taken off there and yet i think in london especially we're very struck by how popular it is among in the city it, mm. among you know people who are earning lots of money etc that that's the impression certainly that that that's been the big growth in in the sort of uh, quite well off cyclists but i think i think you're right that you know still in those heartlands which have always been there actually always um there's been a real 
a real resurgence. Yeah, and I think you know people focus on the new golf thing and the city gents and all that, but I, and maybe just because they um, events often get wrapped around marketing targeted at them, um, and perhaps because of who they are and the influences they bring to bear in the media. Um, they make more noise as cycling fans and get more attention mm. than others. But I, I, you know, I think that they are the crust on the top. I think that there's, you know, I think that cycling is possibly a little bit more democratic than we give it credit for. Actually, um, often. Any reason you're not going back to Dublin, Ned? After our very successful How event many that we, did. we have in Dublin, were you there, Richard? No, I was no, with I Tim Moore, no, wasn't no, it, on that no, occasion? No, yeah, just you two, I, I was there. Yeah, he's Lionel, by the way. Yeah, that's sorry, Lionel. what did I call you, Richard? Just Richard, but. You guys are just similar. morphing into it. There, 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 there were about 15 <laughs> people there, I think, weren't there? There were less than that. I th- I'd say 10. There were more people on stage. Oh, that was hard, wasn't it? That was hard. And we'd, we'd been flown over there by the Dublin Literature Festival and put up in a beautiful hotel, as far as I remember, in mm. central Dublin. A, Wine and a, the event was a huge, a huge big venue, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. That was... Um, oh, don't, dwell on the, don't dwell on the negatives. But there have been lots of good events as well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear a little bit more from Ned's show now. You know, every morning I, I ride out at the famous, <coughs> every morning, not every morning, once a week, every Wednesday morning, I ride, it's <laughs> a bit of exaggeration, wasn't it? I ride out to um, Home Hill Velodrome, the famous old uh, two-time Olympic venue in South London, I'm in the old man section, we just go round and round the circle. And um, I've got a bike down there, and I, I enjoy my, my couple of hours of exercise. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I just have a track bike, and track bikes, there's nothing simpler than a track bike. It's just pedals and wheels and a frame. That's the track bike. Anyway, I'm riding my business, warming up, going around the track, and I noticed that this guy has ghosted up alongside me. He's just riding around. I've never met him before. Never met him. And um, he was one of those guys, I don't want to do it that way, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> he was riding an immaculately restored, vintage, pristine bike with all the steel lugs and things like that. He spent every waking hour polishing and buffing this thing. Um, and I can, and my bike isn't one of them, right? <laughs> it's not impressive. And uh, he went up alongside me, and he wanted to make conversation with me. And um, by the way, did I mention he had a slightly irritating beard? <laughs> um, he's one of those guys. Unless, I don't know his name, but let's call him Benji. <laughs> so Benji clearly wanted to make conversation with me, and his opening gambit was this. He said to me, <clears throat> For me, it all starts with a hug. <laughs> that was the first thing he ever said to me. <laughs> oh, by the way, that's not actually Benji, that's just... <laughs> I went into Google Images and put irritating cyclists with a beard. <laughs> that's not that. So, that's a very difficult question to ask him. You know, what do I say next? For me, it all starts with a hug. I could have said, damn right, for me too. But then, you know, that would like imply that we were sort of brethren of the hub. Um, for me, I could have said, I could have said, not for me, mate. Start to the bottom bracket. <laughs> you would seem to be rough. <laughs> but worst of, worst of all, and this is an absolute sin in the cycling world, I could have had no opinion whatsoever. <laughs> you know, that is the one thing you can't do. That's the kind of thing that gets you blackballed at the AGM. Or, you know, if the UCI get involved, you get docked 30 seconds and handed a 300 Swiss franc fine for having no opinion about hubs. <laughs> Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast. Very grateful to them for their support. Home of cycling. Home of cycling, yes. Hashtag home of cycling. Thanks for that, Ned. That will um, be made into a little Eurosport advert for next year. Um, <laughs> now, you were mentioning, Ed, Ned, in the little break there. That you nearly called me Ed then, didn't you? <laughs> Ed, you were mentioning. Catching. <laughs> Jed. That you were Jed. <laughs> that you were mentioning. What's your Starbucks name, by the way? Have you got a Starbucks name? Richard. Is it always? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a good enough liar to, okay. to pretend that my name's something else. Well, uh, I mean, I, um, yeah, I always get Lionel, L-Y-N-A-L. So yeah. I normally go with um, Tour de France riders. I'm often Bernard. <laughs> Bernard. <laughs> Bernard. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. Or, 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 or Watford players. Yeah. I've been Luther. <laughs> Wilf. <laughs> Wilf. You're not a Luther, Lionel. <laughs> Sorry. I've been Wilf. But Wilf Rostron. Any fans of 18 Watford. I have the easiest Watford. name <laughs> you could possibly, you know, n- how could you yeah. get Ned wrong? And yet, yeah. I, in nine times out of ten, it's I'm Neil. It's not even your real name, is ben it? Or, yeah, it's close enough to being my real name. Ned. It's, it's I can't remember on. your. Just move <laughs> on. This discussion, discussion before. Did you, did you have to change it for equity reasons? Because you're, <laughs> you're going back. You're completing the circle here. Going back to your roots. You were a, uh, a hopeless actor. Yeah, yeah, I was a hopeless actor. And now you're you're you know back yeah. on the stage yeah. in the bright lights. Now you mentioned in the break there that you're <laughs> you're you're forcing. Yeah. Um, 
uh, members of the audience, this might put off people who've bought tickets. Of course, it's entirely voluntary. Okay, to take how, out however, yeah, the psychology so oath. Is the psychology right? oath. Right. Why um, does that go? What's frightening is um, how willing people are to do it. <laughs> oh, you always get. But then we know, you know, on the evidence of referendum. But what is the psychology oath? Um, the psychology oath. Well, Lionel alluded to it earlier. Um, it is the words of a certain bicycle rider on his retirement speech on the Champs Elysees. Do you have to do it in the voice of the controversial you have to, you have Lance to, you have Armstrong? To, you have to a million, yeah, kind of a thousand yard stare and a mild <sighs> Texan accent. And it's I'm very sorry, I don't believe in miracles. That's really good. I like that. That was very good, yeah. I like he that. almost good. like Lance is sitting here, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Ned, we were going to, I'm sure the tour is, I can't wait to see it. It's, uh, it's really the highlight of my November uh, social calendar. Clap him. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> November, yeah. <laughs> Ned, <laughs> this year you you're, you're, you you dipped your toes in the in the commentary waters yeah. last year, 2015. This year you've become a fully fledged commentator. Over, yeah. You, yeah. you you did the Tour de France for the first time for ITV, but you did a lot of other races as well. I mean, mm. you've you've been on the road a lot this year. I have. Um, it, yeah, I've done surprising little races, and it's been a lot of a lot of fun. Um, I have to say, the first race I. I commentated on in 2016 wasn't necessarily the best experience. That's the Dubai tour, <laughs> which is a stinker, really. Um, let's be honest. Um, oh, that's a gig I won't get back. Um, <laughs> there goes that one. Uh, there goes that one. Uh, but were, were you? I mean, you, you were doing so many races. Was it to? Was it just to practice? Was it, to pra- was it to yeah, practice? Was it to practice and to, um, to, to help with rider identification and so on? So, I mean, I think it's kind of generally speaking, like. If you don't, if you're not immersed in a certain job, it's kind of hard to understand uh, the nuances within that job. And I think people from the outside, quite understandably, think that all broadcasting jobs are sort of interchangeable, and it's just telly, isn't it? But actually, it's not. Um, and, and there's a world of difference between reporting or presenting and commentating. I, to my mind, might be in the same environment, but they are completely different jobs. So I just figured the more miles I could get under the belt before. Uh, stepping up with uh, with David and doing the um, the ITV Tour de France commentary, which of course is a hugely different audience and a much much bigger audience than anything else you'll ever do on the calendar. And huge shoes to fill because yeah. you and you and David Miller obviously replaced Phil Liggett and Paul Shaw. And I, yeah. Phil Liggett's been the voice of cycling since the mid eighties. Um, I think y- you were probably quite apprehensive about. I mean, having uh, you've done lots of commentary, mm. but. You know, being the, the the main commentator at Tour de France is a whole. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I mean, I, I think we probably were. We didn't like to admit it, but we we were briefed. You know, we knew what was going to come because people, frankly, don't like change, and, and for good reason. You know, you know, voices. The voice of a certain event is enormously important, and Phil's voice has been people's summers. Eventually, though, you know, every voice in any sport goes away and is replaced by another one, and it does. It is. I think it jars with people, and I was f- fully expecting what we got actually for the first couple of days where people tuned in to the one bike race they watch in the year and heard two different voices and you know, instantly didn't like it um, t- to a large extent and let us know <laughs> you know um, well, it, but it's it it remarkable how it's a long old month and people get used to it very quickly and do you enjoy it though commentary I love it do you, yeah. do, is it, it's does it moment, because it was something that it. you were initially quite reluctant very, to try yeah very because for all those reasons you know one I'm not Phil Liggett um, to uh, it's technical and it's um and I think it, it required a degree of um, immersion in in the nuts and bolts the detail of the sport that hadn't been required of me before that because as a reporter or presenter you always have time to think about you, know, you always have that time to think well he's the the rider who but in you know actually when it's the, the event is happening live in front of you you've got a, a split second and you've got to be right what 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 do you love about it is it because there's that adrenaline aspect to it um, or yeah, it's like watching a race. It forces me to watch a race in high defini- super high definition, you know, in a way that I've never, ha- I've never done before. Mm. When you are on the edge of your seat for five hours, sometimes we're doing the whole stage from start to finish, you know, five hours of the most intense concentration where you're not just watching the screen and kind of in a, in a slightly disengaged sort of way, which I realised I had been doing previously. If you're watching sort of Moto, let's say you're watching Moto2 and that head-on shot of the, of the bunch, actually you're not really looking at the first two riders in the line. You're trying to figure out what's happening in 12th or 13th position all the time. And you're trying to spot which team might be grouping and come, you know. So there's, there's always stuff happening, even in the bald spots and the flat areas of a, a stage. Um, there is always stuff going on. And it's, it's being a, tuned into that kind of detail that made me appreciate, I think, has made me appreciate cycling in the company of David, who's brilliant at getting all that across 
for the first time properly actually so so when you watch it and you weren't at the world championships recently but you presumably watch the, the road race do you, do you when you're watching it now are you understanding it in a different way as well completely Com- yeah 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 completely i mean i'm i think i'm understanding it for the first time you know at, at a different level um and it's very very and i go back to that point i was making about how much how rewarding cycling is as, as a sport despite all its problems um and how many levels it has you can plumb down into because there's nothing wrong with just watching it with a small w you know you can you can do that and you can do what lots of people do and watch the alps come into view and and, and just enjoy this that's perfectly valid experience and at one level totally satisfying but you can also drill deeper if you want one of the things i think that happens when you do watch it or try to watch it like that is that you start to appreciate the contributions of some of the the lesser known riders yeah is there a rider this year that you've been struck by or noticed that you perhaps wouldn't have noticed in the past oh any number really um uh, there's a there's a young rider valerio conti from Lampre Merida, who... Pedler de Charme at the Giro. Was he? So he was noticed by us. So, so stage four, he's kind of set up that win for Diego Ulisi yeah. into that dreadful seaside resort down in Calabria. Um, so it's, it's contributions like that that hitherto I probably wouldn't have taken much attention. And then it's very, what's very good is then that you kind of like internally you mark a card and actually physically I mark a card because I've built up a library of notes. Um, and then to see that kind of thing repeated again, I think on the Vuelta where he mm. is brilliant again, um, and say yes, well, I knew, kind of knew that about him. I'd seen him about that, and that's why, that's what he does. And you know, and to build up a kind of, it's like those. Do you remember those pixel and um, those kind of pixelated paintings that were very popular in the in the 1980s? That if you kind of step away from and cross mm. your eyes, some a three day three D image kind of magically hones into view. But it's actually quite difficult to capture that three D image. It's a bit like that, I think. And each each rider's contribution becomes part of those pixels. So I've enjoyed I've enjoyed that. Yeah. Magic eye picture, yeah, a good analogy, a very good analogy. That um, seaside resort down in Calabria was actually quite nice, wasn't it, Rich? We had a lovely lunch there and the evening meal. We had some very lightly grilled tuna. Um, That is a very good question. It was quite a nice resort. It's just that our accommodation, we were in there for two nights, was Ah, beyond the pale. We... Beyond uh, the pale. Yeah, of course, because <laughs> you, you were you were commentating on the Giro for with Dan the, Lloyd yeah. for the world feed by, uh, put out by the organisers, weren't yeah, you? So, that's right. um, the experience of being on the road c- following two of the Grand Tours and doing another one—I don't think it's from any secret from London. Yeah. Doing the Vuelta from yeah. from London. Do you think, as a commentator, you get more from actually being on site? than you do from, yeah. from watching? Yeah, yeah, you do miss a lot by doing it off-tube. I mean, d- don't get me wrong, it's actually, off t- sorry, off-tube means by, by remote. You know, Picking distance. up the lingo, isn't it? <laughs> Getting the lingo. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you do, it's a nice life, actually, just commentating in the afternoon in London then going home. Um, and you don't have 200, 300 kilometres of transfers every day. But you do, you do miss detail. I mean, Dave, David Miller and I, um, for example, on the on the Tour de France, I had folding bikes with us every day. And most days we would do, we would ride, the, even if it wasn't a mountaintop finish, riding in Cherbourg up that very, very complicated kind of blum, lumpy f- final five or six K. We did that and it gave us a much better appreciation of, ju- and the road book only tells you so much. So that was very important, very, or narrowing in the road. You know, that's, that's that, again, again, these, these are things that I wouldn't have paid too much attention to before I was commentating, but you know, the effect that when the when the road goes from two lanes to one the effect that that can have on a race is just sometimes everything isn't it and to build up that picture by actually getting out there and seeing it is vital what about other other races though i mean Mm. i I mentioned you've been on the road a lot and been to some pretty obscure races any that particularly you particularly enjoyed or or two ends of the spectrum would be um last this time last year actually i went to cover i think the worst bicycle race i've ever been to the tour of taihu lake (laughs) Um, which is nine stages that were basically flat circuit races around uh, these vast Chinese um, cities, most of which house six million people, and you've never heard of any of them. <laughs> you know, they are, it's just an extraordinary part of China, flat as a pancake, grey, nobody cared. No, there were no <laughs> people there, apart from the, the, the odd group that had been compulsorily placed at the We're going to get line. complaints, aren't we, from well, Chinese we cycling fans? No, yeah. they'll complain. Complain, and, com, com, complain all their life. Well, Nobody cared. <laughs> and, um, but yet, that didn't stop the organisation, uh, the people who own the race, using public funds to buy in some of the best experts, not myself, obviously, but the best expertise they could get from Europe. So all the French um, France Television motor pilots and helicopter pilots, they had a Tour de France spec on the race, and nobody cared. Jakub Moretzko won seven of the nine stages. <laughs> seven of the nine. Up-and-coming rider. One to watch. 
Yeah, that's what I kept saying all year, and then he did it precisely nothing. <laughs> Apart from pipping Elia Viviani to that win, do you remember, in the Italian jersey, right back at the beginning of the year, Tour de San Luis, and Viviani spat his dummy out and wouldn't go onto the podium. That's right, so, yeah. yeah. And so at the other end of the spectrum, what, what's um, the... An- another end lots of people care, and it's beautiful, and it's quite a hipster race, the Arctic race of Norway. Mm. That was a, a privilege to go to that race. It crisscrossed the Arctic Circle in August. Um, and Norway's one of those places that it has to be seen to be believed, actually. If you just see a photograph or some video of, of Norwegian hills, you go, yeah, yeah, right, you know, it's a bit like Scotland, or whatever. But actually, it isn't, because when you get there, everything's five times bigger and emptier than you could imagine. And it's just incredible. And all the riders, you can tell when the riders kind of love being mm. at a race as well. And they're just chilled and, they're, you know, produce some good racing and lovely and the people up there and they do love what and also Norway how good are Norway with their kids coming through and everything they've got a bunch of really really good riders now. One, one of the things I mean in your previous role as a, as a reporter you're obviously having a lot of contact with the riders is that something that you can still manage as a commentator is that something you miss a little bit that's a bit tricky actually because I, I do miss that um, it's very important that you you know you, you especially with riders I don't know much about that I can spend 10 minutes with them informally in a hotel lobby and just get a bit of background that doesn't exist it's hard to research without talking to them face to face what what I find a little bit difficult and I think Miller is probably struggling with equally is then you know on the occasions in which you're called upon which do arise to be critical or to put a rider's performance into some sort of context which occasionally you have to do I think that's ultimately going to be difficult to you know, maintain some of your closer ties to some of the riders. Is it you difficult know, or is it easier know. if you don't have... Uh, well, you well, yeah, well, again, that's what I'm saying. So you, perhaps with some of those riders who I knew quite well, um, and perhaps I have, I, a bit see, more, yeah. I have a bit more distance now so that I can say what I sometimes need to say, you know, without, the, without a friendship issue or a closer relationship clouding, clouding that uh, part of my job. Without one of their friends or followers on Twitter telling them what you've just said and copying them in and, on well, and, and then a whole Twitter storm blowing up around you, it happens. your commentary. It happens. I mean, not often publicly, but, you know, messages are sent. And people, they, they are, pecu- not all, but plenty of riders are peculiarly thin-skinned. And often they, they themselves haven't heard what it is. that. So there's, again, a Chinese whispers, you know, a relative will pass it on that, oh, he said this. And, that, you know, by the time it's actually relayed back to you with a few expletives you've just attached, you've just called you know. them the worst rider in the history uh, exactly of time whereas in fact all you said was something perfectly yeah. legitimate that it maybe was fair enough you know so that's quite that's a bit tough that's a bit tough you're listening to the cycling podcast in association with rafa celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004 thank you very much to rafa for their continued support of the podcast we're we're going to be doing an event um in association with Rafa before the end of the year. Uh, details will be forthcoming very soon. If they haven't been forthcoming already, because we're talking two weeks before this is being broadcast. Oh, we are. And, uh, I mean, we've got to rename it because we were going to call it Bicology, weren't we? But, um, were you? Uh, name, no, we weren't really. We weren't no. really. That's just a, <laughs> yeah, we just were. Just a little, a little gagette there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we... Yeah, we're doing a Rafa event. We might have something... For our fans north of the border, we might well, as well unconfirmed oh. as yet, but uh, again, but it may be confirmed by the time this is broadcast. It's really confusing. We could have it? me sort of voicing over at this point now. Yeah. yeah. If these events are confirmed, maybe yeah. we'll slot that in here yeah. now. We've got a couple of events coming up in a few weeks. On Wednesday, November the 30th, we will be at Rafa London in Brewer Street. Richard, Daniel and I will be joined by Cannondale Drapak manager Jonathan Vorters and French journalist Francois Thomaso to discuss what the future of professional cycling has in store. Tickets are free. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com slash live hyphen events for details. If you're quick, you may also be able to get a ticket for our event at the Signet Library in Edinburgh on Thursday, December the 1st. That will feature Richard, me and Francois. Go to the same website, thecyclingpodcast.com slash live hyphen events for details of how to buy tickets for that one. It'll be seamless, I'm sure. Lionel in his kitchen as opposed to Lionel in the National Theatre where we are currently. Um, and where we, we were spotted earlier by some a friend of the podcast who tweeted a picture of us. Really put you off your game, didn't it, Lionel? It did. I wasn't breathing in, you see. Um, <laughs> you know, I, in public, I like to yeah. I like to breathe in Don't before I'm photographed. Uh, 
put put on a bit of Jan Ulrich style off season timber. I noticed this morning <laughs> when when Are I you when guys I still doing your training. Regime? I think we can. Uh, I think we should both be inspired by Ned. We who, should. You know, lost those ten, ten kilos. Did you say? Probably was. Yeah, something mm. like that. Yeah. yeah. Fine example. We're kind of going the other way, aren't we? Like I, I certainly am, unfortunately. Uh, back on the bike next week, which is last week if you're listening to this. So hopefully it's going really well. We should do another one of those long, <laughs> grotesquely unpleasant winter rides. That yeah, we just, actually, oh. you got me at a bad moment there. I was very unfair. That particular <laughs> point. Do you remember our encounter with that um, Jehovah's Witness? Yeah. In um, a little village. Eastwood. You the home of D.H. Lawrence. People could go back and listen to that podcast, in fact, couldn't they? It's yeah. uh, from 2014, from Should November 2014. You want to hear three men very out of breath. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was fun, though. Uh, we rode from Nottingham to Manchester. Uh, Richard, you were spotted numerous times holding onto a vehicle on the climbs. Um, I actually cut out one of the climbs. <laughs> Ned was the only one who made it all the way from Ned, Nottingham to Manchester without... Ned was, without, a, uh, right. Ned yeah. was a terrible you guy. I remember you punctured with. within about a mile of us setting off. I did. And then you yeah. had to go and find a branch of Halford somewhere. I did. <laughs> I had to buy a new tyre and get it all fitted. It was. Uh, but you yeah. could tell that Ned was somebody who rides a lot on his own, couldn't you? Yeah, no one likes me. Yeah, head down, half wheeling. Just, yeah. Yeah, just, <laughs> just, just putting you in difficulty when you're trying to yeah. answer his questions. Yeah. You know, conversation was... Not, uh, nobody likes a half-wheeler, do they? Do you know what's amazing? <laughs> I, I was, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was uh, with a travel company who sponsored the show, Exodus Travels, since we're all plugging stuff. Thank you very much. Hang on, they don't sponsor our show. We'll edit that bit out. Um, <laughs> they, uh, this travel company took me to Mont Ventoux and we just spent three days with some prize riding up Mont Ventoux and it was quite hard because it's quite a long mountain and you get to the top and you're pretty tired and we got to the airport after three days oh, quite pleased with ourselves and this other chap unrelated to our group was sat there British bloke with a bike box next to him who said uh, he said you, you ridden up Mont Ventoux he said, well, he said yeah a couple of times actually and he said yeah I did it six times in one day wow well, you know Six someone who did it even more, don't you? Yeah. Like well, I rode it in June just the once Which uh, for our one of our Friends of the Podcast special episodes about the the myth and the magic and the mystery of Mont Ventoux. Uh, I think that episode is called Heat, Wind and Fear. Nice. Um, and it's available to listen to. It's part of the 2016 Friends of the Podcast package. But yeah, I rode it. I told some stories about uh, the history of the, the mountain and the bike races that have happened on the mountain. And one of the contributors is a musician uh, called James Welsh, who writes music under the pseudonym Camera. And uh, he was inspired to write a whole album of music based on having been to ride Mont Ventoux five times a day for five days, I think it was. Huh. Well, it might have been five times a day for four days. Either way, it was riding up there a, l- you know, a lot, repeatedly. Um, and it was so hot for them that they were starting their first ride at sort of two in the morning yep. so they could get a couple of rides in before the sun was really, huh. really wow. strong. Yeah. Um, but, you know, f- an absolutely phenomenal... Have you ridden it before, Ned? Before yeah, a few times. I right. rode it up on the Brompton, actually. Oh, of course, the, the, yeah. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I had. But you know, once in a day, that's mm. enough, isn't it? Like, these people who can do it multiple times, it's absolutely breathtaking. It's because it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, be- hard. it's a real beautiful... But you, I presume, because you were doing a lot of history, you rode through Bedouin and up that way. Mm. To yeah. Renard. yeah. What's odd about that climb is you do an awful lot of climbing, especially at our pace, um, through that you can't really see the mountain on you get no mm. reward you're just climbing through the forest so yeah. you don't there's no switchbacks over which you can look and say huh i've climbed all the way up from the valley floor to here to motivate you halfway up you'd have no conception of how far you've come until you get past chalet Renard and the mountain opens up and then you go good god i'm halfway to the moon and, and then and then the last bit is just uh breathtaking really isn't it because yeah. you you can't take your eyes off the summit yeah it's, it really is a mountain of it's not quite halves is it because the forest section is a lot longer yep. but i lost my rag with that forest section as people will hear in the Did in you? the episode it was just yeah it was just annoying <laughs> just What's annoying swearing? anyway uh, angry lionel <laughs> ned you're on the eve of your grand départ um are you yeah. nervous i am very nervous <laughs> you are you've been nervous for quite a while haven't you yeah it's yeah but i like i like new challenges you know it was i, 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 I but this is a bit <laughs> it's a bit different do you have how, a warm do you, you have a warm-up act hey do you have a warm-up a support no, I, think act? I am the warm-up act we could have been the support act couldn't we lionel yeah i don't know if i am the like being on your undercard <laughs> how have you gone about it though ned have you written the show and then commit it, it to memory or is there a certain <laughs> amount of uh, it's um it, it's it's structured but improvised 
You got so I kind of know hand. what I kind of yeah I I know what's coming next in theory. Um, and but uh, you know the words that fly out of my mouth are the words that fly out of my mouth. So the, the, fir the first two could be a bit rough and ready. Oh, but that'll be horrendous. <laughs> you'll be in the Very St Edmunds and Chelmsford, but they'll be stinkers. They might be all so, right by the time I get. To so the, the 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 people coming to bury St Edmunds. Oh, we're going to have an awful time. <laughs> they might be. They might be. They might be quite angry. <laughs> <laughs> but by the time we get later in the run, you're you're looking to peak in the in the, the final third. Oh, well, I, yeah, I'm doing a negative run. split. Right. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna like I'm, I'm like Quintana. And yeah. So <laughs> by by Clapham, it will be yeah. highly polished. <laughs> it will be the Champs Elysees <laughs> of cycling stand-up shows. Yeah. yeah. No, I hope. Look, I hope it's fun. And I, um, yeah. There's, there's stuff that there's stuff that's going to happen on stage. That I can't really say actually because it ruined it'd be a bit of a spoiler. But, but how then. how can people find out about it online and book tickets and all that thing? Oh uh, um, yeah. There's a Bicology.co.uk. That's it. And that's got all the dates and the thing. And um, yeah. There we go. Do let us know, listeners, if you go along, what you what you think. Give us your feedback. No, don't do that. It's fine. <laughs> no, you're your fine. Feedback. It's a waste of time. Just <laughs> crack on with your jobs and yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Don't yeah. spoil it. If yeah. we're going on the last night, we don't want it spoiled, do we? True. I'm sure people will let you know if they've <laughs> had a good time or not, Ned. Yeah, I'm sure they but I'm sure, you know, fans sure of so. Ned Bolting will be the people who come along to it. So, well, you know, fans of your writing and dreadful your if they weren't. Common day awful thing. Time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a blazer badge and tie set available in the foyer? That's what I want to know. No, but <laughs> books are available in the foyer to purchase, including my latest, uh, which is out on the 20th. Which um, is called... Which is already it, out now because it's all recorded. Bolting's Velasaurus, which is a bit fun. For anyone who remembers the meaning of lif, ah. right, from back in Douglas Adams, from mm -hmm. back in the 80s, it's kind of a bit like that. So I've done lots equivalent. of mainstream. I've done lots of mainstream interviews to try and publicise this, and I don't think what a single one of them have understood that everything in the book is a nonsense. <laughs> so it's been really hard. To well, I, I asked Ned hard. before we started recording. I asked Ned if he'd be willing to read out some of the entries from the book, and he said it works better on the page. He said, <laughs> but I did just open it on a, on a funny entry. I oh think. God! Gramophone. A writer who talks incessantly about weight. There we go. That's quite good. That's that right. very good. Oh, uh, it works on works on at least two levels. <laughs> I've counted there. That's excellent. Can I read? Can I read you one? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> can I? Can I want to read you the t the special. Right. Uh, okay, okay. No, I'm just I yeah. Just it's good. Back up, back it's up. good. Okay. As I'm chuckling, <laughs> as I flick past the pages. I'm gonna read. I just want to read you the story of um, special, which is um, translates loosely as the special one, I suppose. Oh, bookmarked it here. Special, which is a masculine noun. An oddity, a unique rider, an outsider, the special one. The most celebrated special of modern times was the Uzbek sprinter Ruslan Ablama Ablamatov, who had been reared, so it was claimed, on the scrubland surrounding a defunct Soviet missile silo in a Karalak Pakistan region close to the Uzbek border. His father, Vitali, a decorated Red Army major who disappeared shortly after the Moscow Olympics, <laughs> had ended up living in the silo where he raised his son in a makeshift wigwam erected inside the abandoned missile control centre. Brought up by his taciturn father, the identity of Ablamatov's mother was never established, who continued to guard the silo against enemy aggressors, <laughs> the young Ablamatov grew up increasingly restless. While his father kept watch for endlessly long shifts, Ruslan roamed further and further from home, exploring the semi-arid plains that stretched to the horizon until one day he disappeared altogether. For more than seven years, he was lost to the world. One day, in the early summer of 1993, he resurfaced, riding a rusty rally chopper on the outskirts of the town of Munyak, accompanied by a pack of wild dogs. When the local police were called, the dogs withdrew into the steppe, snarling, and Ablamatov was taken off for questioning. He revealed next to nothing about his missing years, even when interrogated by the same team of experts in Moscow who had deciphered the strange howling language of the wolf girl of Kropotkin. Though he retained language from his early childhood, his vocabulary was restricted to only about seven words, quote, most of which related in some way to bicycle racing. <laughs> Ablamatov remained something of a mystery. An art house documentary was made by the St. Petersburg <laughs> Institute of Fine Arts about his rehabilitation, <laughs> and it briefly found favour with Moscow's emerging post-Glasnost intelligentsia. It featured repeated close-up footage of Ablamatov's teeth, intercut with shots from an early edition of Paris-Roubaix set to a soundtrack from the Pixies. Two years, <laughs> two years later, his case was featured in the United Kingdom in an episode of Channel 5's Famous Freaks. But it wasn't until Ablamatov underwent a series of physiological tests at the Moscow Sports Academy that his obvious talent for cycling became apparent. Tested on the Klyatskoyo track, I think that's how you pronounce it, 
He rode three times around the 333 meter circuit, banking at lightning speed, breaking all records before abruptly leaving the, down the ramp, riding his bike along the corridor and out of the building. And for a further period of seven years, he disappeared again without a trace. The next anyone saw of him was at a low-key press conference in the south of France. In 2011, he signed for Marseille La Pomme and won the Grand Trophée d'Armagnac in his first season. In, t in 2013, after his son made his debut in the Tour de France, a dishevelled and tearful Vitaly Ablamatov was arrested in Tashkent, where he had presented himself at the French embassy demanding to be flown that night by helicopter to Po. He was eventually convicted of attempting to smuggle meat products and failure to pay parking fines going back 20 years. <laughs> Ruslan Abamatov continues to ride for Lampre Merida and recently won a stage of the Tour of Britain into Stoke-on-Trent. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the longer entries. <laughs> Brilliant. I, I think we the found one of the subjects for our Friends of the Podcast specials next year. <laughs> yeah, let's just play that. Um, listen, that we should wrap things up, but that's a fine note to end it, end it on. Thank you very much, Pleasure. Ned, Thank for joining us. And the hey, best, of, Clapham, eh? you're best gonna of luck. Love it. Best of luck with the show. You're going to love it. Yeah, it's not the thing to say to a cyclist, but break a leg. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for The Cycling Podcast. Continuing a recent tradition of The Cycling Podcast, this is an addendum to, to this week's episode, um, because we recorded with, with Ned Bolting now about 10 days ago, uh, before he set out on his tour. I've caught up with him at the London Velodrome, um, where we're at the London Six Day. Ned's working here, but you are now mid-tour. How, how have the first few dates gone? <laughs> it's been it's been absolutely brilliant. I've, abs I've honestly I've loved it. It's been completely terrifying. Quite big venues. I mean, you know, sort of five hundred seat theatres, and, and without blowing trumpets or anything, just most of them are quite close to being sold out, and um, that's terrifying. So pacing up and down in your dressing room, all on your own, waiting to get going, is nowhere. It's nothing like any of the rest of my work. It's complete mind-numbingly frightening. But when you get up on stage and the first gag kind of works. Um, it's brilliant. I've really, honestly, Richard, I've really enjoyed it. Walking through this, the, the bit of a cliche, isn't it? You kind of leave your dressing room and walk through these weird tunnels up onto the stage and the bright lights there. But you walk past all these provincial theatres. You walk past these framed, pic, framed pictures of all the people who've appeared there before, like Elkie Brooks and Ken Dodd. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Now, Ned, what have you got in your dressing room? Have you got a rider? Fruit and mineral water. A stale pear. Fruit and mineral water, mate. Me. M&M's, uh, do you specify a colour? Fruit and mineral water. I am doing this on fruit and mineral water. Well, anyone who's got tickets for future shows, they've heard there how important it is it gets a good response to the first gag. So if you can maybe get <laughs> together and, and, and greet it with a stony silence, just to, just to test them. He's, he has described the venues as provincial theatres after all. The first gag is visual. So don't ask me to tell you what the first gag is. It's a visual gag, but it relates in some way to recent events in cycling intriguing well that's good though it's got good you're enjoying it and, and you'll be polishing it for the the yeah. final one in, in Clapham which I'm going to come along to which is quite a, a way away yeah I'm I'm worried about that there's a lot of people I know coming to Clapham and um and London audiences are horrible you know with their metropolitan ways and their world weariness dreadful people <laughs> they're definitely going to try and give you a, a <laughs> tough time a bit heckling there well that's great Ned um, that it's going so well in the, in the meantime Thanks very much, Ned, and enjoy the rest of the 160. Thanks very much, Richard. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.